Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and I'm here with David Kirkpatrick. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So, you know, it's, it's a new year. Happy New Year. Hopefully you didn't stay up too late last night, uh, you know, uh, and you're ready for 2023. Yeah, you know, I've tried that a few times, and then you realize the next year looks a lot like the last year. I'm not a big <laughs> guy, so. Yeah, and, you know, I don't want to age myself too much, but, you know, having kids and stuff, staying up late just doesn't happen as much as it used to, and all those things, man. I need, I need my I need my sleep anyway. What, what good does it do? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> but if you celebrated – Hey, that's all. That's that's great. Hope you had a great New Year's Eve and uh, that you're uh, ready to learn some uh, Kentucky history. Uh, but we got a special episode. We're doing a little bit different today. Uh, we're actually going to do a Kentucky history what if episode. Um, now, if you're not familiar, uh, basically saying what if something different happened in Kentucky history, how that would have changed, how that would have affected different things. Of course, this is all just speculation and there's no right or wrong answer because this didn't happen. Uh, we can only stick with what actually happened. But just for fun, New Year's Day, um, letting everybody, I'm sure everybody's sleeping in or, you know, getting their New Year started right with some Kentucky history. We, we wanted to do something a little fun, a little different. Um, so our topic, though, what if Kentucky joined the Confederacy? Starting out tough, right? <laughs> Right. It's probably one of the most debated topics in Kentucky history, just among people out on the streets. Yes. And, uh, you know, this may ruffle some feathers, but again, this is just hypothetical um, right. and, and so forth. And and we'll try to be as historically accurate or uh, as we can, as far as like what would have possibly happened. Um, but a few things just to kind of lay the ground rule. Uh, and these are the things that come to my mind first is if jo if Kentucky would have joined the Confederacy, First, the big thing is the Ohio and the Mississippi, Mississippi River. Um, right. the, the other thing would be the effect on the people because uh, the people of Kentucky obviously were split naturally uh, the way it played out. So how does this affect that, um, people's feelings towards the Confederacy? And then also um, it is no longer a border state as in in between the North and the South, but it is a border state as in it's the – you know, top of the north or top of the south. So that changes that as well. So where do we begin, though? Oh, that's a tough question because it's an interesting topic. You know, and it, from reenactors to genealogists, people have kind of delved into this uh, pretty often over the years. Um, I think the thing to remember is that like other border states, Kentucky is deeply divided. You kind of mentioned that, you know, the population is, is very split on what to do. Um, the government in Frankfurt's a good example of that because you've got Brian McGoffin, who's from Mercer County, uh, who has your know, open sympathies for the Confederacy. Uh, he was not a fan of, of Lincoln's call for troops, and he refused actually to comply with the federal government's uh, request that he send troops, or not request, but um, demand that he send troops. Uh, and he really wanted to keep Kentucky out of the war and, and neutral. The problem for him is the legislator. Certainly in 1860, and it, it grows more over the next few years to be this way, is very uh, unionist. So there's a stalemate between the governor and the legislator on what is going to take place and what role Kentucky is going to play in the war. And uh, eventually, McGoffin just resigns in 1862. He, he sees he's in a rough position and uh, was probably, you know, on the verge of arrest if he hadn't, in my opinion. Um, we saw that happen with other folks. So. 
you know, yeah. he steps down, and you know, Kentuckians argued across the floor with the legislator. Uh, it's, again, there were they were pro unionists, but there were a lot of Confederate sympathies still there, and they argued across dinner tables of who they should debate <laughs> and who should hold their allegiance. And you know, this is the sort of debate that wasn't just watched by people here. It was watched by people in Washington uh, because Kentucky you, it plays a huge role in this. It is probably as important as the state has ever been in national history. Kentucky's played a pivotal role in a lot of points, but I don't think there's any point when it was more important than uh, during the eve of the Civil War. And Abraham Lincoln famously said that you know he wanted to have God on his side, but he had to have Kentucky. He was right in that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I think it's worth pointing out that. Kentucky had no real way to stop the war before it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, during the election of 1860, they didn't wield a whole lot of power in terms of uh, the electoral vote, for example. Um, so when the votes were counted for the Electoral College, Lincoln comes up with 180 votes. And uh, there are two Democrats running. There's uh, John C. Breckinridge, who gets 72 votes. And then there's Stephen Douglas, who gets 12 votes. And in between those two guys... There is another candidate uh, called uh, the Constitutional Union Party, and uh, their platform is basically simply, we have to hold the union together. Secession Mm -hmm. needs to be put off. Whatever we can do to preserve the union needs to be done. And uh, so the candidate only needs 152 votes to win. Even if Kentucky had been wholly Confederate, those 12 electoral votes, you're going to a Democrat uh, there was no way they could have swayed the election. It just wouldn't have happened. So um, so in that sense, Kentucky was not as influential as they could have been. But in terms of military strength, once it's evident that there's going to be a fight, uh, Kentucky really uh, shines in terms of its importance. Uh, Lincoln was right, whether it was geography or the population to draw on or just the economy. He needed Kentucky. Yeah. And, and well, you bring up too John C. Breckinridge, who ends up going to the Confederates, going to the South. Uh, and he's, he's a Kentucky boy, right? He was he vice president. Um, and so that, that's another interesting uh, person talking about how Kentucky was divided. You know, you have the governor, the legislature, and even a uh, presidential candidate who is, who is all, you know, we're all <laughs> over the place for how it was going. But, uh, one of the biggest issues the South faced kind of during the Civil War was, was the you know, inability, I guess, the, the toughness in manufacturing the weapons they needed to fight the Union. And, I mean, not only did the Union have more men, uh, they, they could arm more, clothe more, feed more. Uh, those men were easily, uh, more easily than the South could by, by, by any means with you know, so many cities, uh, industrial uh, centers being up north, the north just had that advantage. And Kentucky really doesn't, you know, doesn't sway that much. It doesn't help in. It doesn't help the South in that that manner. Uh, if Kentucky had sided with the South, it would uh, not have uh, even the playing field. I guess that would be the best way to say it. Uh, but it certainly would have bo- boosted the, the Confederates' fortunes um, due to the development of river trade and factories in the state. Um, but at the at the start of the war, Louisville alone could bo- boast a steamboat uh, production company, uh, a rolling mill that could be could build rail railroad uh, rails and an ironworks that could have been uh, converted to wartime production. So that would be a big benefit for the South is getting that Louisville right. hub and that Louisville uh, economic engine. You know, besides that, that's not a, there's not as many positives of Kentucky um, now geographically. Uh, Kentucky was super important uh, because it was a you know, long border state uh, with the Ohio River, um, and you know that could have strangled northern trade and prevented military equipment and personnel from being transported uh, to the Western Theater. You know that's if you look at Kentucky on a map, and you you know the northern tip is pretty much all the Ohio River. You know, I mean, you're pretty much drawing a line saying you can't get across here. And I mean, it's going to be hard enough for troops to get across the river to uh, anyway. But if that's other side of that uh, river is fortified by, say, 
um, the South, then that becomes a huge problem. Uh, Northern states like Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois uh, were, were you know, solid, solid union, uh, but they were kind of low population and almost completely un- undeveloped industry-wise. And they yep. could, they, you know, they could not put up enough men uh, and materials like cannons or rifles into the battle uh, to make the difference. Uh, so you kind of even got this more of a uh, this weaker state um, there on the border, you know, of Kentucky. The Western Front becomes a lot more, I guess, uh, manageable. Um, uh, you know, they they would need to get have the goods brought from the east, and the Ohio River was the best way to get there, and, or you know, through the mountains. But if you have Kentucky being controlled by the Confederates, the Ohio River becomes a more uh, conflicted area. Um, also, if Kentucky had sided with the Confederacy, it would have prevented all of this from happening. It's uh, no wonder that both Confederate General Polk and Union General Grant you know, kind of hovered just outside of Kentucky at Paducah near the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi River. That's a huge a huge intersection. Uh, yeah. and having control over that, you know, we talked about this or we're going to talk about this in some episodes down the road. Or maybe we already have. I don't know. I've lost lost track of them. <laughs> yeah, um, you know how important it was, even when Kentucky was being settled, that control of the Mississippi River. Um, but anyway, Kentucky also had the previous uh, Cumberland Gap in the east, which, if in Confederate hands from the beginning, could have you know severed one of one more of the Union arteries into Kentucky. Uh, this is kind of why Kentucky and the Confederacy ultimately spent so much time. You know, trying to capture it, you know, take take control of those areas, because that's I mean, when we're talking about war, it's all about moving moving men, supplies, getting getting the things you need to the places they need to be, uh, which makes it tough. Yep, yeah. like you say in warfare, you, you're always going to outflank the enemy, and you've got to get around their side. And Kentucky is right in the center of like you you mentioned, maybe not. Uh, the states as a whole, because Missouri and places to the west, but as far as a population center, Kentucky was acting as a shield uh, to the south if they had remained neutral or if they had joined the Confederacy. Um, so if Kentucky had been solidly in Confederate hands, the Union is going to spend a lot more troops reinforcing the few population centers they do have in the west. So if you're in Cincinnati, uh, if you're in Madison, Indiana, which is a smaller town today, but you know, it's been around for a while, uh, if you know, you're in one of these cities along the river, uh, you're not going to send troops to fight in the Eastern Theater because you've got to fortify these areas to prevent Kentucky troops or uh, any Southern troops that are using Kentucky from crossing the Ohio and attempting to take pressure off of you, which is kind of what Lee ends up doing at Gettysburg later in the war. He tries to invade Pennsylvania. He's drawing troops, you know, uh, westward, and he's kind of... Uh, bringing the war to the north. So that's something the north is going to have to contend with. Rather than bus all those units eastward, they're going to have to focus on the west. Um, and, and then there's population. Uh, it's hard to imagine today, but Kentucky was more of a powerhouse in 1860, and we alluded to that a little bit. Um, today, uh, today, Kentucky is about the middle of the pack when it comes to states uh, with populations um, that are about a certain amount. We are 26, I think, with 4 million people. So not terrible. Uh, you know, we're beating no, most of the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're certainly not New York. In 1860, Kentucky had a fourth of that. So you're looking at 1 million, 1.1 million people. Uh, that put them in the top 10, which was significant. Yeah. And, uh, it was ninth out of 33 states. And what's more, uh, of the states that were in the top 10, eight of the states ahead of Kentucky, uh, were, well, there was Virginia, which is solidly in the Confederate camp. Uh, you've got Missouri, which had a population explosion, even though it was formed after Kentucky. So it's a border state, though. It's kind of divided. The other states are solidly in the Union camp. So it's to the, the point you made earlier in terms of manpower, the Union has the cities, and uh, the South is always going to be behind the eight ball in terms of their ability to recruit people. And so if Kentucky had gone solidly Confederate, uh, you know, it would have made a huge difference. Uh, now, people are going to point out, I'm sure in the comments, that, well, there were quite a few Confederate veterans from Kentucky, and that's true. Mm. Uh, the way the war actually played out, 
Kentucky sent, though, three times as many troops to fight uh, for the Union and for Lincoln as they did for Jeff da Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy. So there is a divide there. It's not even really a 50-50 split. You know, it's three to one. Um, but, you know, if all those troops had joined the Confederacy, it's really going to shift the manpower considerably. And it's going to change the way they can proceed with the war. So with all that said, if Kentucky had sided with the Confederacy, uh, it not only is going to bolster their chances at success, but it's going to change the way they end up fighting the war as a whole. Um, the Confederacy would have fortified places like Paducah. Uh, Louisville and Maysville probably would have been fortified kind of the way we saw at places like Fort Donaldson. And, uh, you know, we probably are going to be reading a lot more today about Brownwater navies uh, than we <laughs> do. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, both the Union and the Confederacy had a number of ships. Uh, can you call them ships? Boats? Large yeah, boats? Yeah. <laughs> that, Things that float. <laughs> yeah. They, they apply the deeper rivers. And we see a lot more of this on the Mississippi. Um, but, you know, one of the benefits is in places that don't have lots of roads, you can place really heavy guns on these boats and you can really shell uh, defensive positions. So uh, yeah, that would have made a huge difference. And instead of seeing those further south, uh, at places like Vicksburg, Mississippi, which mm -hmm. in May of 1863 sees Union troops uh, on the eastern side, and then the river on the west uh, is being shelled by by these gunboats. Uh, we're going to see that sort of thing unfolding in Kentucky. So it's usually kind of devastating. I mean, the whole war was, but to have these large shells up from these ships uh, into earthworks and into cities really you know, takes a toll. Um, so that would have been certainly a, a detriment. Um, if the Union was able to achieve dominance, though, on the Ohio River, and again, that's something it's going to have to fight for. Mm -hmm. But if it's able to achieve that, it seems likely the North is going to have to lay siege to Kentucky somewhere near a major population center to encircle it, but not close enough to deal with any troops that are garrisoned there. So it's one thing to subdue the, Mississippi, to subdue the Ohio River, right? And you've got free trade and you can move down it. It's a completely new animal to cross that river and make uh, sort of an amphibious landing. And yeah. you know, one of the problems is, uh, we'll probably talk about this more in a minute, is that the Ohio is not that deep in places. Uh, so, you know, that's a problem. Um, but, you know, where are you going to land at? That's the question. Kentucky has a long border. Like you mentioned, the Ohio River runs the length of the northern border. With the western part of the state, though, being more Confederate in sympathies, and even if Kentucky had gone solidly Confederate in the scenario that we're, we're thinking about, there are still going to be areas that are more supportive than others, because that was true of all Confederate states and all Union states. Um, so even if Kentucky had gone solidly Confederate, with the east, with the west being more Confederate and eastern landing makes more sense, not only are the sympathies of the people more likely to be with you or at least – not be against you in terms of making supply lines. Uh, those are going to be shorter. It's going to not take as long to get supplies to the troops. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's likely that you're going to pick a place, maybe Boone County, Gallatin County, where you can land and then you're just a stone's throw uh, from Cincinnati, which is going to act as a, a hub for supplies. You can kind of surround that urban area of Northern Kentucky. You may pick a place near Louisville, maybe Oldham County, something like that, where Troops could be landed, and it's a short march. So that's the next question the Union's going to have to deal with if Kentucky is fully Confederate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you mentioned too about you know troops and, and loyalties, you know, just because Kentucky in this scenario goes Confederate, that doesn't mean there's not Kentuckians who would you know go and join the Union Army and, and so forth. You know, that's in every state that that was the case. You know, um, right. but it is interesting when you look at this how this would pl plan out. It's almost like the objective of the union would then be to get Kentucky. That uh, right. definitely on the western front. You know, that, you know, if Kentucky goes or secedes or goes to the Confederate, they're one of their main objectives is well, let's get Kentucky back or at least you know take over Kentucky so that we can have that supply chain. Because that changes, you know, yeah, that's step number one, and that's uh, that changes things. Uh, you know, if the union could kind of seize those areas that you kind of brought up, you know, Cincinnati or or, or even Louisville, um, then that, that, you know, then they're able to kind of take chunks 
uh, by sailing up uh, up the many rivers. You know, there's a lot of rivers in Kentucky and that kind of flow up and down the north-south axis. And then you've got supply chains, which is the big ordeal you want in any sort of military conflict. Uh, this would have been you know, made difficult by the fact that there were uh, direct rail lines between Louisville and Nashville, uh, allowing the Confederates to reinforce their positions quicker uh, in, in, uh, in these areas. And if Kentucky is Confederate and Nashville is Confederate, then the, rail ra- the railroad goes pretty quick. So uh, that, that's a big benefit. Um, so, you know, seizing con- control of the K- Kentucky and licking rivers would probably be uh, a very big advantage for the, the Union or the, you know, especially taking up the mountainous part of the state uh, from the West. Uh, so that would be a big, a big grab or a big, uh, you know, priority. Uh, the Kentucky River is pretty easily navigational or navigable from the Ohio all the way up to Frankfurt, which is, you know, kind of a big deal. Um, if, and this is, this is a big if, if Kentucky was subdued, the Union would then do exactly what they did in 1862. First, they would use the Tennessee River to extend their reach deep into western Tennessee, and then they would uh, station troops at Cumberland Gap to prevent any flanking attacks from Virginia. So, I mean, this is kind of you know, where we're getting into uh, where we just mentioned. If Kentucky was to the south, the Union's number one objective would be we got to get Kentucky back. And then right. they would have probably done the exact same thing they actually did in the Civil War as far as getting those troops in position to push the, the, the uh, Confederates farther south. Um, but, you know, if but, you know, this scenario only would play out if you know, the South uh, does nothing with the newfound ally, ally. You know, if Kentucky's in the South, obviously that's going to change their game plan. Uh, but with uh, Kentucky in the court, it, it seems like unlikely that the Confederacy would have not been uh, proactive and Jefferson Davis would have had two options, uh, try to hold the Kentucky River as a boundary uh, and siphon, on, siphon Kentucky troops uh, to the East to overwhelm the weak, uh, Gen- General McClellan uh, right away, or use this extra territory as an opportunity to conquer the Western theater all outright, uh, which, you know, you could see that with Ohio and Illinois, some of those weaker territories. I mean, just think if they were able to push all the way up to the North, you know, take those ca- ta- ca- uh, and take those territories, then you only have a Western theater or an Eastern theater to deal with. And that changes big time or changes the overall thing, you know, quite, quite tremendously. Absolutely. Yeah. And in thinking of the Western theater, it's easy too to forget. I think for for the average person, maybe who doesn't read too much history, how much it influences the later part of the war. So the reason you have Grant facing Lee at Appomattox is because Grant made his reputation in the West. So if there is no Western war, or if the union loses the, the Western theater, that changes the outcome in the East you know, in many, in many ways, um, you know, not least of which is the election. You know, if the election of 1864 rolls around and Lincoln has lost Missouri and the Kansas territory, uh, thanks to troops moving westward from Kentucky, um, or if a part of, uh, the voters in places like Cincinnati or Baltimore or Pittsburgh, even because that's, you know, if you go up the Ohio river, that's what you're going to hit. If, you know, they are still looking at a possible invasion from the Confederates. You know, that is going to sway a significant part of the electorate towards McClellan, who, and for anyone who doesn't know, McClellan's a Union general. We talked about him in that capacity earlier. He ended up running for president. And, I, you know, who knows what he would have done, but signing a peace treaty is a, a good bet. So even if land isn't lost in the West, if, you know, they hold it, but uh, the Union's able to hold what they have, just the fact that the Confederacy is perched on the Ohio River ready to strike northward can have a huge influence on the election. You know, in addition to that, holding Kentucky firmly um, means holding St. Louis, which is going to allow the Confederacy to do kind of what you said. It's going to sail up the river, and it's going to threaten places like Springfield, Illinois, which is only 100 miles uh, you know, from the riverbank. And, uh, you know, that's a huge blow. Um for the Confederacy or for the Union, rather, because, uh, you know, having a capital, a state capital lost to the opposite side uh, would make a big impression. 
It certainly did in Kentucky because the way the war played out, Frankfurt was the only state capital in the Civil War to switch sides. Um, so, in re, you know, in reality, the only state um, that that lost its capital would not have had that happen, but it may have inflicted that on a few other states just by virtue of switching sides. Um, it's not really possible to know for sure what would have happened, but it's likely that if Kentucky had joined uh, the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy, it really would have boosted the Confederates' chances at winning. And I don't think that's uh, overstating the case too much. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it certainly would have increased their chances, if not turned the war altogether. And it may have weakened enough opinions in Congress or in Lincoln's cabinet to try to sway him away from something aggressive and maybe you know, moving to one of the thousand shades in between an actual invasion, yeah. such as a blockade. Uh, you know, if you're Lincoln, you know, that's another option. You can blockade the Confederate coastline. You can uh, patrol the, the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and kind of squeeze them that way. Um, but whatever would have happened, one thing is for sure that if Kentucky had joined the Confederacy, it's going to drastically change the Civil War uh, and the way it turned out. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Like I said, you know, I, I don't, I mean, the Confederates' main goal was just to become a a sovereign nation, right? They didn't really want to take over the, the, um, the North. Uh, so I, 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 I definitely agree that if Kentucky joins the civil war, or, I'm sorry. <laughs> if Kentucky joins the South, that definitely strengths, strengthens their chance of just becoming a separate, uh, entity. Cause you know, would they, I, I, I don't really think they would have been able to, overwhelm the north you know and, and all that sort of thing but i don't think that was their intention anyway um it was more so lincoln's intention of saving the union and keeping it all as in one uh you know one nation and so forth um again you know i think we mentioned it before you know being a border state is tremendously the big issue uh you know the ohio river was was big a big deal uh, by kentucky staying neutral um it gives the union that uh, you know cushion. You, know, you get the Ohio River, but then you get all this hundreds more of miles south before anybody even gets to the Ohio River. You know the uh, Confederate uh, state of Kentucky, if we want to say that. You know ha- had its own capital in Bowling Green, um, even named a county and all this kind of stuff. But you know it really wasn't anything. Um, scarce i guess the most scarce or um not scarce the most um dramatic thing that happened as far as the confederates in in um uh the uh in kentucky was them taking the 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 capital um but you know all that changes of course if if kentucky would have stayed or or joined the south um anyway uh anything else to add i mean it's i think it's pretty good i think we've covered it pretty well the only thing i would add is that i think the the number one thing that changes uh, if Kentucky joins Confederacy, is time. Time is on the Union side as the war plays out historically because they've got more manpower. They've got uh, the advantageous uh, battle lines drawn up because they've got all these rivers that they can kind of sail down. Uh, you know, the South has to win and win early if they're going to win, and they're unable to do that. I think if Kentucky joins Confederacy, time is now on the Confederacy side because. Lincoln is going to have to expend a lot more troops in a short amount of time. And as we know, elections, whether they should or they shouldn't, are dramatically influenced by wars. And if you know, there's been a lot of losses from the Union and no real victories to show for it, uh, you know, it, it drastically changes things. So, Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Um, well, if um, that's all we got, uh, again, uh, let us know what you think about our uh, Kentucky history. What if, what if Kentucky joined the South? Um, uh, and if you have any suggestions, let us know in the comments, let us know what you think about it. Again, all hypothetical, all for fun. And you know, nothing, nothing better to do than to uh, speculate on a new year's day. That's um, right. <laughs> um, again, hope everybody has a, uh, good 2023. Um, there's plenty of Kentucky history coming, um, for the next few months. I mean, it's already lined out and recorded and it's ready to go. So um, anything else before we go? I think that's got it. I hope everyone has a great start to the new year and that it lasts the whole year through. Yep. Uh, Thank you all for, again, for listening 
for the many years you have so far. And if you're a new listener, welcome, welcome aboard as well. Uh, and again, have a great year and thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Take care. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel. The stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Night Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. the assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.